just want to welcome colleagues and friends um, in clean tech to our side event today on clean tech and the transition to net zero. My name is Gershwin McCure. I'll be the uh, moderator for today. Um, but first, let us get some welcoming remarks from uh, the director of the energy department at UNIDO, Mr. Tarek M. Taira. Over to you, Tarek. Thank you, Gershwin, and really a pleasure to be here with you in this side event on the Global Clean Tech Innovation Program and um, the link to the um, uh, Net Zero 2050 ambitions and targets uh, on the margins of the Vienna Energy Forum or in the context or in, in part of the Vienna Energy Forum 2021. Um, indeed, I was just uh, uh, sort of in the conversation uh, in the run up to, to this meeting, I was uh, briefing the colleagues and the participant on the panelists on the conversation this morning um, on the uh, momentum around um, meeting the, the Paris commitments uh, for um, uh, uh, net zero by 2050, but also the sustainable development goals and in particular SDG 7 targets by 2030. And I think there is broadly within the, the the scientific community there's a broadly an understanding that this kind of transition that we are embarking on is is uh, is quite unique uh, in the history of humanity in the sense that it is um compared to other technology or or let's say economic transition phenomena this is probably one that is um the most profound uh and 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 uh, transformational but also it's the one that is uh, mission-driven, uh, engineered in a way. And so what is the implication of that thinking about it is that we really have to get there, which means that uh, to, to net zero by 2050, if we are to avert uh, the climate crisis, which means that it, it, it puts a greater um, demand on ingenuity, innovation, technology, um, not, a, not on only uh, innovation in technology, because a lot of the technologies we need to, to uh, solve the problem are not yet there but we also need to put a lot of emphasis on um all kind of innovation in 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 policy in in business models in um, uh, in social um and behavioral side to get to that ambition so so it is it's a, a transition phenomena unique in human history that is fundamentally anchored on the issue of innovation uh, uh, and so that's why, in, from our perspective, the role of innovation and entrepreneurship is fundamental for this transition to succeed. So this is one, one aspect of it. The second aspect of it, I think it's important for this conversation we have today, is that the needs and the demand for these solutions will happen in emerging and developing countries. And in countries where... Um, uh, uh, affordability is a big concern, which means that we need to shift the thinking uh, where often quite uh, on, on the technology side, a lot of innovation happened in rich economies or in advanced economies. We need now to shift the thinking that innovation need to happen in um, developing and least even developing countries. We need more and more of, of that uh, uh, capabilities to emerge in developing countries if the transition to succeed. This is a fundamental part of it. If we need to succeed because that's where the demand is and where the needs are. The third aspect of this whole transition is that we are also um, witnessing a convergence of technologies on the energy and the clean technology in the climate space, partly the digitalization uh, revolution and, and what's called the ICT infrastructure. Um, uh, Internet of Thing, uh, and, and so all that facilitate a different type of uh, landscape for innovation. So with the convergence of these three dimensions, I think from our side, you know, we see that we have to really give a particular attention to the role of innovation and entrepreneurship in developing and emerging economies. And that's why we have been really working on this for the last uh, 10 years through the uh, Global uh, Clean Tech Innovation Program in partnership with the Global Environmental Facility. We want to scale up and now we have the opportunity to create a second phase of that program and what we call the GSEC 2 program, expanding the, the, the kind of services and, and support we offer to 
our member states. Um, uh, <clears throat> but I think we need to, to do more and, and much more can be done. So, so uh, there's a lot of uh, emphasis on, on ecosystems in developing and emerging countries because this is the greatest opportunity for human history, for innovation and for, for entrepreneurship around the technology space. And I think that's, that's what I just wanted to bring to you, part of the conversation that happened in the morning as a way to welcome you to this debate and making sure that this is quite anchored in, in, in the conversation we take. So uh, with that, and I think we will have an exciting discussion ahead of us. I think I can stop here and, and, uh, and get back to you, Gershwin, uh, to, to lead the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek. Thank you for those, um, those insights. Um, I'm sure, as you say, the, the conversation will be quite quite vibrant. I think there's a number of um, issues and challenges and solutions that will come from this conversation today. Um, and, and so without further ado, I just want to do a little bit of an introduction on what Unido's work is in, in clean tech innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and then I will introduce our panelists for today. So, well, firstly, let me just say who's on the screen. Who do you see in front of you at the moment? Um, we have Fatima Azara Benhamani, um, a founder and CEO of Activa from Eco Activa, sorry, from uh, Morocco. We've got Achara Pumi, managing director for the PAC Corporation from Thailand. Uh, we've got Kevin Braithwaite, Vice President of the Network for Global Innovation. Um, and also we have um, Anthony Dorse from the Cleantech Group. Um, we have uh, as a consulting manager and also PFAN's uh, partnership manager from UNIDO, um, Marco van Waferen Hogefors. And these five esteemed panelists will give us their insights on, on the topic on the table today. So uh, through our global clean tech innovation uh, program, UNIDO has been developing and implementing clean tech innovation and entrepreneurship projects over the last 10 years, as, as Tarek has mentioned, and in nine countries. We've been learning and improving, and we now stand on the edge of launching the program in 13 countries and we're looking to expand that beyond 13 countries so um so we're looking to 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 grow our portfolio and grow our footprint across the globe we believe that the best way to support commercialization and scale up of clean technologies is to support innovators and entrepreneurs to transform their the ideas into vibrant businesses and doing that through business acceleration and investment facilitation. Uh, also, secondly, to strengthen clean tech innovation ecosystems and policy frameworks to allow for this kind of commercialization environment within countries. And thirdly, to build a strong and co coherent programmatic approach to the benefit of all, um, all the global partners uh, and, and countries. So in our discussion today, I'm asking the panelists to share their experiences and vision on how to tackle the challenges in ensuring the commercialization of clean tech. Let me remind the audience of two things. Firstly, if you've got a question or a comment, please feel free to, to add it to the Q&A tab on the right-hand side. Um, then also, there's a poll ongoing um, on, on this as a tab, so please participate in the poll as well. So without further ado, I will move into the questions for, for our, our entrepreneurs first. Our entrepreneurs are Fatima and Achara. Welcome, Achara. Um, and the first question is, this, first insight will just be to firstly give us a little bit of background on on your company and the product and the impact on the environment you are you are expecting and forecasting from your product and and and, and your products, and perhaps just give us some insights on what are currently and have previously been the challenges that you experience as entrepreneurs um, in commercializing these these products. So perhaps Achara, you could go first, and then and now ask Fatima second. Thanks. 
Hi everyone, I'm Achara Pubi, Managing Director of Pack Corporation from Thailand. My business is about um, air conditioning, uh, energy saving, air conditioning, water heating, and now we have solar energy uh, air conditioners, and also we are expanding to uh, indoor air quality solution innovations. And this is uh, the business of my of myself at Corporation. And uh, right now we are in the growth stage, mm, scale up stage of the of the business. We already have customers in Thailand, in my countries, and overseas market. Uh, we are um, expanding to. Uh, uh, Asian countries markets uh, and the challenges right now is about the COVID pandemics uh, because of our um, target customer mostly is ho hotels and resort and affect a lot with these pandemics. So I try to um, looking for a new market with existing product and uh, also existing market with new product. And this is uh, uh, the introductions and also uh, we before I joined GC in year uh, in year 2017, we struggling in many aspects: financial, customer, market, teams, uh, and uh, this is the ch key challenges that we have faced. And uh, we try to solve it day by day. And right now, we are quite in the in the better situations. Yes, thank you for the, thank you, this Tara. is the introduction um, first, thank you. Fatima, perhaps now from your perspective, um, similar question, uh, a bit of background on, on, on your product and, and, and yeah, and, and the company, and then some challenges perhaps. Um, maybe I can share with you some images or a screen. Can I do that while introducing? Uh, first of all, um, my name is Fatima Zahra bin Lahman. I'm a founder uh, of Ecoactiva and so my profile is a hybrid profile between an architect and a thermal engineer. So that gives me something which is a unique perspective, how to look at the buildings and how to do affordable, inclusive buildings that doesn't consume energy for anyone. So I would like to show you something because images, I believe, talk more than words, especially when we are at the... Uh... Is it visible? Uh, can you see my yes. screen? Yes, yes, yes. We yes. Can. yes. So the um, company is Ecoactiva because we believe that the, f the start from any solution is um, first uh, should be uh, related to eco and then it could be active. So in here we have an input that is from the ideas, the design, which is the only phase of any building uh, conceptualization that doesn't need any input in terms of money when we can do the most economical solution based on design and then active which is will make through this process that we are implementing energy investment a clean energy investment affordable because we are lowering at the maximum the energy consumption of any building so the applic the, the, our solution is an application which helps uh, to track or to get step by step to um, the sustainable low uh, energy consumption mm -hmm. building we help architects to have inputs that are based on the climate especially climate is energy mostly how can we use this energy into the building to make it a performance element element in itself we are trying to do something that we call engineering without engines so our goal is to 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 help like we're not going to say that to solve but to help give solutions through the building which comes at intersection of every field like you do in agriculture at some moment it comes to the building you do an industrial it comes at the building to help to solve that challenge of sustainability and energy efficiency in buildings where we position ourselves uh, in regarding to solution that exists where we're not uh, focused only in eco-saving building or green building, which try to maximize both of them. And this is where we set ourselves as a methodology of, uh, of creating building. How do we do that? We just watch and imitate processes. Nature know mostly how to do it. Industry know how to do it. What we try to make it affordable is that we imitate 
processes and we put it in the platform to make them available for anyone who wants to use them. Like we try to democratize the access to green information that will help green building to exist at lower costs. The big challenge, it's the market maturity. I think that everyone, I don't know, uh, our solution is uh, uh, be, uh, mainly orientated to emerging countries because where when we lack the resources is when we, we need the most uh, affordable solutions. So the market maturity nowadays, when we talk about clean technology or green solution may not be up to that, uh, those information. So for us, we try to change our narrative based on who is in front of us to make that, uh, to give multiplicity to definition of what clean energies or clean technologies or um, low, low, low consumption buildings. And we try to face in that market um, maturity. We have the big screen or big picture of our solution but we try to measure our successes and our market introduction really by small steps, like uh, having accreditation from some university that is um, making uh, or, or learning based on our methodology or our platform. And we based our, on the network. And here I would like to, um, to point the importance of GCIP for me as an entrepreneur, because I was always an architect, but an entrepreneur for me, it's something that changed while I had the experience of uh, GCP and here the network is very, very important to make you uh, stay longer um, in the market with your solution. And it leads you to building that ecosystem. So in here, I try to, to, to picture that we are like uh, free electrons at the beginning and then we became entities, each one bringing up solution that can work with another solution. And starting from that, when this is consolidated, we can start to radiate our ideas or have someone who can be ambassadors of your idea. And that would be all for me. For now. Thank you, Fatima. Uh, very insightful. Um, I think our panelists, our rest of our panelists, um, don't have to speak anymore because I think you've you've dealt with some of the key issues there um, um, that that perhaps some of our uh, our partners will also bring up around ecosystem and markets, and market maturity and readiness. So um, perhaps then to ask our 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 partners in um, in Engine, our um, Kevin. Uh, Anthony and Marco, other than introducing yourselves, how how do you see at current currently? How do you currently influence ecosystems and 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 um, and entrepreneurship so that we get the result of of a of a greater amount of companies that are commercialized and scaled? Um, so perhaps starting with Kevin, then moving to Anthony, and then Marco. Sure, thank you, uh, Gershwin. So maybe to introduce my organization and, and what we do and what we do in Engine, so in, in the GCIP program. So Engine is a network for global innovation. We're originally an initiative of the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, uh, LACI, an incubator in um, California, Los Angeles. And what happened is uh, LACI made a big impact uh, pretty quickly. Um, within a few years of its launch, um, by 2018, it supported over 120 startups, helped them raise 228 million, created uh, uh, 2,000 new jobs, and generated over 625 million in long-term economic value for the city of Los Angeles. So the focus then was, can we spin Engine out as an independent entity to take that experience, take that expertise, to benefit other cities, regions, countries, and corporations around the world that are looking to support uh, the clean tech entrepreneurs that are developing the climate solutions we all uh, desperately need. So what we, we do is uh, we help these uh, entities to uh, support um, entrepreneurs more effectively through working with them to launch new incubators, uh, accelerators, programs, etc. We've done that from Australia to Brazil, Finland, Mexico, and many other countries. I'm also pleased to say that we've also been supporting our team, uh, GSIP since the beginning, uh, the nine countries, and we continue to be um, inspired by uh, more than a thousand uh, GSIP ventures we work with to date, uh, including the great examples from uh, Fatima and uh, Achara here. 
our focus is really what can we do to bring uh, best practices, uh, network connectivity, access to new markets, to raise the capability of both the entrepreneurs we support, but also the trainers, the experts, the mentors in each country. What can we do to, to raise the, uh, the capabilities, the connections, de-risk and improve the likelihood that these essential um, ventures will succeed? So in, a, in essence, that's what we, that's what we do. Thank you, uh, Kevin. Thank you, but but also, I mean, I think you 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 your uh, engine is is very instrumental in the actual um, execution of accelerators themselves, um, and bringing those best practices to bear on 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 the entrepreneurs that we have in the room here today, and others, and the thousands that that you've spoken of before. So this business acceleration is really one of the key steps, and and a, a systematic business acceleration. It's really one of the key steps to a supporting in enterprises towards co commercialization. Um, absolutely. Um, uh, maybe just also very stress, uh, Gershwin, I think, from your point, this systematic approach is really quite unique uh, to, to GSIP. And I think we're very excited uh, going forward with all the ventures we're working with yeah. over the next number of years. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks. Um, one of our other partners, Anthony, through Clean, Clean Tech Group, um, you guys are, are, are working on, on innovation ecosystems and policy frameworks, um, which we, we, we also believe is a really important pillar um, to ensuring commercialization and an en enabling environment. So perhaps uh, you could say a few words now. Yeah, thank you, Gerswin. Thank you to the team for having us here today. Um, you know, I think at the very top, Tarek said something important is that to actually get these technologies into the hands of demand owners, start to achieve the impact that's necessary, you need to take an ecosystem approach. So it's not just simply training up a few entrepreneurs, picking them and trying to make them successful. You need to create an ecosystem that's going to engage innovation, also be creating innovation in perpetuity. So Clean Tech Group, very quick background. We are a clean tech research consulting firm. Typically, what we do is we work with global corporates, we work with governments, and help them to understand how they can leverage external innovation, if it's a corporate, to improve competitiveness, maybe to drive down costs, and of course, to achieve sustainability goals. So I think what makes this approach uh, important to developing ecosystems is that we are used to advancing the understanding of the demand owners. So those be corporations, project developers, governments. We are also used to working with investors to help them understand which technology areas are most poised to make an impact, profitable, generate uh, opportunities in the long run. So when we go on the other side and we work with entrepreneurs, we're really helping them to be laser focused on meeting that demand need. So there's a lot of great resources out there for helping entrepreneurs launch, engage the requisite resources to grow. But what we're really focused on is how do you solve those big picture needs of the demand owners, of the big corporations, of governments undertaking large projects. And I think in this respect, it's going to be a really, uh, it's going to be a great exercise to work with Engine, who's going to be setting up the accelerators and helping those operators in the ecosystems to do, do a little bit better for the entrepreneurs. And for us, we'll be working on the policy side, as Gerson said, we'll be working with investors, companies, and also directly uh, with you all, the entrepreneurs, through the GSIP program to create a system where demand is going to be more oriented towards the right technologies, and then the supply of technologies are going to be better positioned to meet the demand need efficiently. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um... I'll move quickly to, to Marco to give us a perspective as well. I think we're, we're always hearing that um, one of the key challenges is around finance and financing of, of these startups, um, early stage technology and companies. So what is your method? How, how do you see this commercialization through the eyes of, of the financier and I think 
You've also done a lot of work on, on, on gender lens investing, um, which is a key element that we, we, we seem, you know, not to have considered very well over the last number of years. And now we, we're, we're doing much better at that. So perhaps bring some perspective on those issues. Yeah, thanks, Gershwin, and great to be here and happy uh, to be official partner of GSIP now as PFAN. Uh, uh, we have worked together already uh, for, for a number of years, and um, I have to say that Achara has also been supported by PFAN as, as one of uh, one example of GSIP alumni that went through the PFAN program. Uh, but let me say a few words first on what PFAN is, what we do, and how we fit into the program, and then uh, say say something about the work we do currently on, on gender lens investing. So PFAN stands for the Private Financing Advisory Network, which is uh, a global network of clean energy and climate uh, experts, uh, all based locally in basically all the developing market regions, so from Latin America and the Caribbean, to, to Asia uh, and, and Sub-Saharan Africa and, and uh, Central Asia, also part of our, our, uh, our scope. Uh, we're a donor-funded program. Um, we don't finance companies ourselves, but our main goal is to, uh, as Gershwin said, uh, bring access to finance to the entrepreneurs that we're supporting. So our main KPIs are really around bringing external financing into the companies we support. Um, we, we uh, typically support companies that go for their first external round of financing, um, so Series A, A, but we also work with, uh, with, with companies a little bit further in the startup to scale up journey. Um, and if, if I kind of have to position us and, 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 and uh, explain how we fit into the GC program, you can probably see us kind of in the as the next stop in the startup to scale up journey from the entrepreneurs that uh, go through the acceleration program of GSIP, um, because we know th there still are one or two valleys of death uh, before really getting to, 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 to the money and the finish line. And that's where PFAN tries to play a role. Um, we started back in 2006 and we actually tomorrow, another side event uh, of the VEF, we are celebrating that we have leveraged uh, $2 billion of uh, private and public uh, sector financing, but to a large extent, private sector financing into the projects that we have uh, supported uh, since inception. Um, in terms of, um, and, and the focus we do really, we have really is on the business plan and the financial model to really make sure that the companies that come to us um, can uh, present themselves uh, according to the expectations that an investor will have uh, in terms of that. So we work a lot with the businesses through these locally based advisors to bring the business plan and the financial model up to scratch and, and make it bankable. Uh, and I think here we have, have the link with gender as well. We really see a, a growing body of evidence uh, supporting the business case of gender, just like we saw a, more in the past that incorporating ESG factors actually makes a lot of business sense. It reduces risks, it creates bigger opportunities, higher financial returns and, and bigger sustainability. The same is true for gender. Um, a lot of people think about gender mainstreaming, about women-led businesses, uh, but that's only one dimension, I would say, in terms of uh, looking at it. Uh, uh, looking at the workforce, looking at the um, the customers and, and the value chain are also very important gender lenses to 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 take uh, because uh, let's face it, a lot of a uh, big part of the consumers of a lot of the companies that we all work with are women. So it, it makes a lot of sense to to have that reflected in the workforce. Um, and And just as a closing remark on that, in terms of innovation, there's also quite some research that having a gender diverse company also in the leadership side actually can increase innovation uh, sixfold, up to sixfold. So there's really a big business case to be made to have a gender diverse business from leadership all the way down to workforce and, and, and the customers and value chain that uh, the entrepreneurs are working with and for. Uh, I'll leave it there, Gershwin, and I might come back to some of these points uh, later. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Marco. Um, well, quite an interesting um, fact at the end there. You know that innovation can be can be multiplied sixfold within companies if we do 
do have a gender lens on when 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 staffing our companies when 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 um, building our companies um, so so almost within these answers you've given already there are some key solutions we already see in order to improve the likelihood of 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 more innovation but also improve the likelihood of commercialization of these innovations thank you for that um maybe fatima um what have you found to be um you know very helpful i think you've mentioned some aspects uh, already very helpful in your journey in terms of support from gsip as an example uh, what kinds of advice would you give other innovators in terms of um, how to to take on the challenges that you've already um, experienced um, and maybe are there things that you could see institutions like UNIDO and other support institutions what could we do better what 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 kinds of things are we not seeing from a from an innovators perspective um, in order to make this the step change we want to make um, toward net zero because everybody says we need to do action now and but the action needs to be you know accelerated and and and, and there needs to be a step change so perhaps uh, your your views fatima you're on mute at the moment uh, so from my perspective, as I already mentioned, I, I think that it's very important to dif make the difference between being a good professional and being a good entrepreneur. And I think that an entrepreneurship, it's a language that mm -hmm. gets so many updates so quickly that you need to be up to date. And for me, like it really opened my perspective being in GSIP, because as I said, I've never asked myself, um, at which which market I'm, I'm, I'm addressing my product because as an architect i know that everyone who builds is my market but it's not it's not that it's not that when you are doing something that it's new that it's technological that will be rejected by definition because we are not a digital native uh, generation in the bracket the, 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 the one who decides now in emerging countries the first difficulty it's not the solution in itself it's how you are presenting the solution through which channel for some people this is still something that's not a uh, actual i think that once of the i don't know if the pandemic had some good good part of it but i think that this uh, link or this immersion quick immersion into a um, digitalization will help i think jump uh, the curve through something uh, new easily and and uh, and I think that uh, if it's something that I would I would not put myself in a position to advise uh, like clean tech program or UNIDO because I believe that um, so many people are there to always do the right shift in the right moment. But maybe from pers entrepreneur perspective uh, and from what I've seen in the um, whether in Morocco or being uh, in the US for the, the, this big event that that uh, rate all the GSIP uh, participants, it's that uh, I think that uh, there is an attention that needs to be a little bit more uh, put toward the network in itself, because each time we see complementarity, we see that we can jump uh, some a. Uh, 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 steps because someone is already doing them or we can have some inputs that are very valuable because some other person uh, I, I I know that one of the biggest part is the network and maintaining the network alive because uh, something that it's part of any entrepreneur it's being hope hopeless and when you are hopeless like it's very difficult to uh, be a um, to, to to feed a network like yourself needs some some help and i think that if we have that support from other institutions that are strong enough to always provide that hope you know that connection that pushing forward uh w within the network i think that's 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 great and the other thing that i would like to point from my my side uh, through, uh, with gsip is that it gives immediately my solution a credibility so it helped me uh take some milestones off my timeline of uh, having having um having this credibility i think it's very important it's uh, so it's something that i would like to point out and uh, to 
thank for mm. it, uh, this program. That's for me. Thank you, Fatima. Um, Achara, um, any thoughts on your side with regard to specifically perhaps um, you know what are what are key interventions that that help um, this commercialization journey and this jump in terms of accelerating commercialization um, because there are a number of challenges and perhaps you your insights now seeing that you are in a growth phase are actually quite quite will be quite useful here for for us as Unido and for our partners but for the broader audience to to know how how this works and how it could be done better. Yes, uh, I would like to say thank you to UNIDO and PFAN, uh, GC program. This is a broad program that accelerates me and, and my company to be uh, our situation right now. And uh, for uh, both GC and PFAN, uh, I learned a lot for, um, from how to shape the business model, especially uh, in PFAN, we're focusing on um, the uh, financial models. I would like to share my experience and would like to, maybe it will be uh, a suggestion to the program. At the GC program, it is focusing on the technology market and uh, the thing uh, about business, but not 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 too much focusing on financial models and the investment investment models or funding something like that and we can if we can combine these two perspectives together it can be benefit it can be benefit to the SME or startup because of uh, not only for the technology or the market you have to focusing on the numbers as well because of investor firstly they would like to know about the investment, the, the numbers, the amount, and then technology. Uh, and GCF gave me a lot of um, knowledge, uh, coaching, mentoring session. Kevin is a very good mentor. I, I go to featuring my, my project in many countries around the world, and he's my mentor since in Thailand and, over, and uh, internationally. Uh, I form, uh, my uh my uh business idea in this program because of firstly i uh, did not focus well in my own business because many things have to be done and it's have many uh innovations interested at that time but i try to learn about focus so uh, if uh, i would like to have some advice to the innovators or the newcomer in a GC program, I would like to ask them to focus about themselves or their project and do their, do their best in every uh, opportunities they get and try to connect connecting the dots. I start thing with GC and I then can uh, go further to be in many program and go to uh, overseas market since that beginnings but you have to do very best every time you be on the stage every um event you have to be the best so you can have the next opportunities because you have be that kind of person and that kind of entrepreneur and it is the very very important for the entrepreneurship and you have to learn uh, lifelong learning and have the strong networking and connections. And uh, if you can keep in touch with uh, the institute or organization that help you and you can help them and strengthen your networking, it will be beneficial in your next journey. And if you uh, can improve that I, I, that I already mentioned uh, about GC program or UNIDO, I would like you to uh, strengthen the program much more uh, focusing on finance and for investment opportunity. It will be benefit for the the in uh, the entrepreneur and the innovator better. Oh, and one more thing is about the local action because of this is the international platform and sometimes it cannot be engaged in the local government. So it's very hard for us as the entrepreneur in our country because of the program itself did not match with the our government policy and is it possible to to uh, uh for unido to act as a, a chain agent or the bitch 
between the entrepreneur in this in each country with the government. And this is my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Achara. Um, some some excellent points there, and I think what um, I mean just quickly, we Unido has also listened to a lot of um, the feedback from from entrepreneurs and from from local um, institutions. And one of the issues is that that we we need to work closely with governments in in country. And I think Anthony will will, will maybe share a little bit more about that in a, in a moment, in order to make the the, the connection clearer, make governments uh, have a clearer understanding of, of, of this space we operate in, this dynamic, new, evolving space, which can be challenging from a, from a, from a policy perspective because of the, the dy dynamism. But yeah, let me not talk too much. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll mix things around. Maybe Anthony, yes. Um, the, the, the question that's on the table is, you know, what is the next, a big challenge to commercialization um, of innovative clean tech uh, innovation or clean tech innovation. Um, what do you see coming down the line or, or how can we already make these step changes that we we envisage for this net zero ambition? Um, specifically, perhaps you could talk about the, you know, the, 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 the sector you work in. Yeah, well, I think it takes, uh, it certainly takes private sector action, but that needs to be coupled with government action. And a really good example I heard more recently here in the US is uh, around talking about creating more policies for net zero. Somebody had said, look, if we had waited for private companies to create civil rights opportunities for minorities in the US, it probably would still be an ongoing dis discussion. So you do need the government policy, but thinking of how we make that policy or how we adjust it in a way where it's going to be more amenable to technology. From cleantech group side, we really try to avoid presenting it as a trade-off between economic growth and decarbonization. What we try to do is take an innovation cluster approach, and that's going to be looking at local levels. It might be provincial, it might be state, even city, understanding what the innovation resources are, understanding what the industrial strengths are, and then picking out a few factors that could be tweaked to create more innovation for decarbonization, decarbonizing local industries, looking at local innovators who can plug in, solve problems, bringing in outside innovators, bringing in outside resources, investors. Um, and this is not something we came on our own. Um, this was pioneered by uh, Michael Porter at Harvard Business School, um, Scott Stern at uh, MIT. So there is a whole philosophy around innovation clusters, and we really try to look at those as beachheads for decarbonization. So how do you take that, again, that demand ownership from corporations, project owners in clusters, in economic clusters, and how do you start to decarbonize those clusters through innovation? And typically innovators are gonna be springing up in those areas with a lot of, uh, with a lot of economic activity so that's our approach is looking at the clustering approach and you build these clusters upon each other and then you can start to help governments envision what the changes are going to be. And that really decarbonization can happen in oftentimes in lockstep still with economic growth or upgrading of the economic system to a higher tech base. Uh, so that's the approach we take to the bigger picture understanding of how decarbonization fit the government priorities. Thank you, Anthony. Some, yeah. Marco, your perspective? Yeah, thanks. Kush. Let me focus more a bit on the finance angle here, which is closer to my heart than, um, than, than I'm, I'm not a technology expert myself. Um, so I think what, what we see and what we try to do, and also going back to Achara's comment, we, 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 we're trying to, to bring GCF and PFAN closer to each other, as, as I said in the beginning. Uh, so hopefully that will, will tackle some of your comments there. Uh, but also as PFAN itself, we still try to see how we, we can get closer to the money. As I said in the beginning, we are we are effectively a project preparation facility or an, an act as an honest broker where we try to match the entrepreneurs with, with, with investors uh, from, from DFIs to impact investors to, to venture capital. Um, but we see and we saw this especially also in, in the COVID period um, 
that uh, it's really important to be to be as close to the money as possible. So we don't want to turn PFAN to, into a financing vehicle, but we, we do want to, uh, to to get closer to financial instruments, uh, maybe uh, set up uh, vehicles together with other partners. Uh, and in fact, this is also part of the GSIP uh, design program to see how that can be done in, 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 in the countries where, where GSIP is operating. But that's clearly something that PFAN is, is, is keen to further explore as well, because we see some gaps in the early stage financing, uh, both when GSIP companies, uh, 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 before they come to PFAN, but also uh, after, let's say. So there, 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 there's really a need for kind of blended finance type of innovation yeah. funds for smaller amounts of money uh, uh, coupled with patient capital. Um, and actually, there's one example of one country where uh, GSIP is also going to operate, um, where we are involved as well as UNIDO. Uh, we were awarded uh, by the uh, UN uh, Joint SDG Fund um, to to basically set up a, a renewable energy innovation fund in, in Uruguay. Uh, so very excited about that where we uh, hopefully will will have uh, an opportunity to uh, in that way contribute as well to the further decommunization of uh, of, of of uruguay and 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 uh, the, again the, the the presence of gsip in that country nicely links into um, into that um, yeah and, and and i think i mean we already spoke about gender but in terms of next big challenge i think is also when you look at yeah, the participation of women in the in the sector, that's definitely something that uh, we have two good examples here in this panel. Uh, but I think if you look at across the board, there's clearly some way to go. Um, and again, I think there's a big business case there to um, to further improve this. So we're really committed to um, to see how we can uh, get there, uh, working together with other accelerators and trying to really capacitate not only the entrepreneurs but also the advisors that really and mentors that really are agents of change that can hopefully influence businesses early on to um yeah to take these gender dimensions into um consideration uh, for future uh, benefits thanks question thank you marco uh, kevin you have worked with with enterprises for a number of years now um in 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 taking on this commercialization challenge, so to speak. Um, so what do you still see there to be big challenges ahead for this rapid commercialization of really a great solution, high impact solutions? What are the, what is it? And, 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 and perhaps we have a way forward already to, to tackle it. Thanks, Gershom. I think certainly the, the whole approach of GSIP is to uh, accelerate, to de-risk, to help these com countries, uh, companies um, commercialize much faster. However, I think we still have a big issue with with time. Uh, and I think for everybody in this space is, is aware of this. I mean, the um, IPCC said back in 2019, we have 12 years to make a, a market impact on uh, to avoid irreversible damage from climate change and we now have nine years left yet many clean tech ventures that we work with can often take eight nine ten eleven years or more to really get to commercialization and really scale and that's the key issue that that, that we're focused on and i think as a gsip community amongst the thousand plus ventures we've we've worked with thus far that is the the big um, issue so we need um not just new technologies and innovations we need the existing innovations to scale as well we need to scale faster we need to hit lower cost we need to reach uh, more affordable price points and we need to reach more users much faster quickly to make an impact that we that we need and one key challenge that we see is the accessibility of pilot projects many of the entrepreneurs we work with in gsip are at this catch-22 situation they can't raise the financing and the support they need unless they get pilot projects but they can't get pilot projects because many potential corporate partners customers think they're too risky so they're caught in this in the strange situation and one of the things we're focused on on doing is um really outreach to potential pilot sites uh, nationally globally what can we do to build bridges what can we use 
use the GSIP network? What could we do, perhaps new instruments to incentivize uh, corporations and potential pilot sites to be more engaged? And then when companies, uh, GSIP startups, have successfully developed uh, a number of pilots, have started to grow, really get uh, traction, and that's an example uh, early on from a Chara and PAC corporation in Thailand, where then international expansion becomes the next the next goal that can be a challenge that can be a, an issue and that's something that we're also looking to tackle through through gsip through the support that we have globally and nationally through each of the different uh, accelerators but also by building more bridges between the different gsip countries the international um, cohorts and really focusing on collaboration and connectivity as being a way to reduce the the barriers so going back to what fatima said earlier the power of of the network so really leveraging that we have uh, over a thousand uh, ventures thus far many more as gsip goes into these 10 13 countries going forward i think that would be uh, very powerful so those are just two of the areas that i think are challenges that need to be addressed Thank you, Kevin. That's a great insight. Um, time and, 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 and pilot projects, essentially. Um, yeah, I think we forget that we, we you know, various um, publications, various studies have told us, warned us um, on, 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 on our behaviors and our lack of action and our slowness to action. Um, and, and, and you quite, quite rightly put it into good perspective that, that we only have nine years left, so to speak, uh, before we do irreversible damage. Thanks for, thanks for the reminder, Kevin. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, perhaps, I mean, we've got seven minutes left. Maybe um, I was going to ask each one another question because I don't see any questions in the Q&A really, but perhaps just um, going around the room before I hand over to Alois, just in, in, in a minute or so, um, just give us your, you, Maybe from the enterprise perspective, Achara and Fatima, what are the next steps for you? Um, what do you see coming up for you and, and, and what challenge are, challenges are, are you looking forward to taking on next? And perhaps for the, for the rest of the panelists, also to think about, you know, what's next? How, how do we, what are our next steps? What do we do well um, in order to, to lower the barriers to improve our um, our response to these challenges that have been raised um, by the by the various um, by the enterprises themselves but what you've brought up yourselves uh, so maybe achara first um, just what's next what what are you taking on next 